Okay, welcome everyone to this Open Science and SEI webinar. I think we now have a critical mass and we can uh, get started for the day. So uh, let me uh, start by uh, telling you that this, uh, this webinar today will be recorded. And uh, Ian, whenever you like, you can click the record button. Uh, we uh, will actually post the presentation sections of the webinar to the SEI YouTube uh, channel afterwards, just so you know. So uh, we have in front of us an exciting program to uh, discuss open science and what it means for SEI. Uh, we have a guest speaker from the Centre for Open Science, and we'll have a response on that keynote presentation from SEI Research Director Orsa Pershon. And there'll be an opportunity throughout to ask questions and uh, of course participate uh, in the breakout groups. Uh, today we'll be supported by the Open Science Learning Project team and uh, the, that includes Neil Hadaway, Sarah Talabian, Brenda Ocella and Daniel Deba. So let me say up front that if you have questions as you, as you go through, please uh, pop them into the chat box and uh, there is a Q&A section after the presentations where we will uh, gather those together and, uh, and pose those and direct them to the right person. So what is open science? Uh, let me start with a short story about uh, this gentleman here you see on the screen, Niels Bolin. He's a Volvo engineer who invented the three-point seat belt in 1959. This uh, innovation replaced the sash style seat belts that you might know from an airplane style, and it became an industry standard that we're all familiar with today. And this innovation undoubtedly saved millions of lives. So what's this got to do with open science? Well, this innovation was in fact released as an open patent, which means that it was free for the entire industry to go ahead and use. Uh, the Volvo CEO at the time, had agreed to take this route towards an open rather than a closed uh, proprietary patent after he experienced a personal tragedy uh, losing a relative in a car crash. Uh, the conclusion that, that uh, the CEO and Volvo made at that time was that all of the research and development that went into uh, developing this uh, three-point seatbelt was too valuable to the public to keep to themselves. So they performed a, a very significant public service in, in making that uh, innovation available. So there, there are a range of definitions of uh, open science, uh, but essentially the idea is to make science as accessible to the public as possible, because it is after all a public good and having it available to everyone can help to make problems, uh, to solve problems quicker and uh, potentially as well the solutions better. So now uh, to come back to what it is uh, for SEI. Uh, well, in this Open Science Learning Project, we, uh, our intention is to uh, try and answer the question, how should SEI engage with open science? And uh, in this slide, I've, I've given some examples of uh, the, the guiding questions that we pose for ourselves. Uh, what are we doing now in terms of open science? What could we do? and what do we want to do? And as part of that, uh, the circles below show some indicative activities that we'll be undertaking as we, as we uh, go through this learning process. And we call it a learning project because we're trying to understand the, the concept and its relevance to this organization as we go. And we want to involve uh, as many people across the organization, SEI wide as possible. So uh, one of those activities uh, in the first circle is an internal mapping. So trying to understand uh, current activities that we, we're uh, already doing in a way that uh, might be consistent with the principles of open science. Uh, things like having our policy briefs and uh, discussion briefs online and available for free, uh, attempting where we can to publish in uh, open access journals, that's on the publication side. Uh, but there are many other aspects of our work uh, which are uh, consistent with open science and one of those really goes to the core of what SEI is about 
and that is uh, to try and take science to decision makers, this bridging role. Uh, and uh, so we're going beyond pure openness, but rather trying to uh, present the the science and our uh, understandings uh, to an audience that can make decisions and, and lead to change. And what could we do uh, that could, that's governed by uh, some of the inspiration we might draw from other uh, organizations that are similar to us? Uh, it's also uh, in some ways you could say constrained by the funders that we have that support our project work. Uh, there's an increasing tendency towards uh, more open practices. Uh, one example is the the new EU Horizon Europe uh, funding, which uh, succeeds the Horizon 2020 funding, and that has open science alongside uh, uh, some cross-cutting considerations such as ethics. Uh, so it's gaining uh, more and more uh, prominence, and we need to be able to respond to that as, a, as an organisation. So then the final circle and area of work in this project is to uh, decide for ourselves what we want to do, what is open science for us as an organization. So we need to set the ambition level, uh, we need to adapt uh, the open science principles uh, to what is relevant to the SEI context, and then we need to also make an assessment of uh, the current SEI systems. Uh, are we set up to uh, be able to uh, deliver our, our work in an open way and what implications does that have for our work uh, day to day? So that will ultimately end uh, with us preparing an SEI approach to open science and this will come in the form of recommendations to the Global Research Committee, uh, which Osa Pershon leads. And, uh, we we hope to uh, come as far as possible with some ideas of what that will look like, but also make some recommendations for uh, how SEI systems might need to be adapted to uh, make sure that this is a realistic prospect for us. So that's that takes me to the end of an uh, introduction. And up on your screen, uh, you have the uh, the uh, agenda for today. I've also pasted that into the chat box uh, so you can see um, anytime you like. So let me now uh, introduce our keynote speaker, Melissa klein Struhl, who comes to us from the Centre for Open Science and she has a, a diverse uh, background. Uh, it comes from uh, cognitive science and she's uh, worked in uh, many much many areas of empirical research, uh, and uh, since that time has uh, broadened uh, to to work in, in the Centre for Open Science. And uh, I am very excited to hear her perspective today on open science and how it might be relevant for us as a research institution uh, and our bridging role. So I'd like to ask Melissa now to take the floor. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. All right. OK, thank you so much. Um, so good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here, uh, albeit virtually. Um, so just a caveat as I'm getting started here, uh, the Center for Open Science was founded by social psychologists. Um, and similarly, my background is in basic experimental psychology. So while I study, uh, for instance, child development, my context has usually been uh, sort of in lab studies that may be several degrees removed um, from policymaking. Um, so a lot of what I'll talk about today is about sort of incentives and decision making and structures within kind of purely an academic context. But then we can also look outward both in terms of like how an individual uh, institution can make choices about what they do <clears throat> and then including also how you might be interacting with external partners or messages that you're trying to send out uh, to a policymaker or anything else like this. Um, so I hope that there'll be some good connections for you all, um, and I'm excited to talk about you, uh, talk with you all about that a little more. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so as we all know, um, even if we're going to limit ourselves to what you might think of as sort of like a traditional set of academic stakeholders, 
we know that the values and the choices that we have as individual scientists are never made in a vacuum. They're going to be part of an ecosystem of contexts that surround us. So this could be everything from what my university requires me to do, the types of venues that are available for me to publish in, um, and then even down to just either formally or informally what my peers think is good science and what they're telling me they want to see from my science. Um, and then, of course, I'm also trying to stay employed. I'm trying to keep my job. I'm trying to succeed as a scientist. Um, and we know that very much um, succeeding as a scientist is very closely linked to publishing papers. Um, it's actually you know, pretty remarkable, you know, in terms of the types of things that are rewarded or the types of incentives that people have. Like it's it's you know somewhat notable how strong this single incentive to publish papers in uh, high profile journals is for scientists. Out of everything that we do as scientists, out of all the activities, all the things that we contribute, this one thing, getting published in journals, has a you know very very strong impact on how we're evaluated. And that means that whatever desires we have to get our science right, to do a good job, we also are gonna get rewarded for being published. And that means that we're gonna get rewarded for doing the kind of science that's easy to get published. And historically, that's gonna mean things that are new, things that are flashy, things that have a big impact, um, and, obviously, and ideally, uh, results that don't have anything that's kind of inconvenient or difficult to explain in context of whatever else the story is that we're trying to tell. Um, and this set of incentives, uh, we think, lies behind a lot of the dysfunctions that we see developing in research cultures. Um, and we can sort of trace downstream from the types of pressures that individual scientists or individual institutions are under um, through to individual behaviors. Um, so I have the next slide, please. Thank you. So individual scientists, uh, decisions that they make in the lab or in the context of a single study, um, all the way through to its broader results on scientific literature and progress. So for instance, if conducting a replication isn't something that other people find very exciting, we don't publish it, um, if we're not making our methods available to other people, those are the types of things that are gonna inhibit us from being able to self-correct. So we often talk about science as being something that's self-correcting. We find our errors, we detect them and we fix them. But the less that we know about what's there and the less time we have to slow down and check our work, the less well able that is to function. Similarly, if we're reporting selectively, um, if we are not taking the time to make our science as error-free uh, as possible, over time that can degrade the credibility of the literature. Um, and we know that it's really, really important uh, that we are publishing things that are credible. We, we want our science to be uh, very strongly supported. We want to be able to not to say that we have no doubt about anything that we present, but to be clear uh, and well calibrated when we're saying this is something that we strongly believe to be true, this is something we think might be true, but we still have a lot of doubt, so that people who are reading it can really evaluate what we know and what we don't know. Um, this, these types of problems really do impede like our real central values as scientists. Um, our research gets slower and less accurate. Um, and in particular, we waste lots and lots of time, money, resources, our own energy and stress, um, uh, going down blind alleys because we're tracking down something that we uh, couldn't clearly understand because of a lack of transparency. Um, the types of impacts that these sorts of problems can have on an entire research field are things that we see across a wide variety of domains of, society, of science. Um, and we also see it in both the processes and the results of that science. Um, so starting out with the process, can I have the next slide please? Um, the Center for Open Science is currently conducting what we're calling the Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology. So this is a systematic sampling of 51 high-impact preclinical cancer biology papers that were then identified and which we then attempt to reproduce. So to run the same study again um, on a new uh, set of data to, to uh, collect that data and then to analyze it following the methods of whatever that original paper was. Um, could I have the first animation popping up here? Um, I, yeah, there we go. Great. So the thing that we find here that was really shocking and honestly fairly depressing is that it actually just turns out to be very challenging to get enough information about what happened in the previous study um, to be able to conduct um, a replication without getting information from a source other than the paper, other than what's available. So just by reading the paper, you often couldn't get the data that it was based on. You couldn't verify the results of that particular study. Um, and then one more click. 
could I have the next uh, thank you so much. Um, essentially, what we found is that out of these 51 papers, it was never possible to take the paper and the publicly available materials and to just run the study based on that. It was always necessary to get in touch with the original author, have a back and forth, ask questions, discover things that would be important for the experiment to actually run correctly, um, but that hadn't been documented anywhere clearly for people to find. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? We also see these issues coming up in the results of the studies. So this is something that people might have heard referred to as the reproducibility or the replication crisis in psychology. So here what we're seeing is that if you do 100 replications that were sampled uh, from the uh, psychology literature, um, we so rather than picking out studies that maybe you're a little suspicious or you think something might uh, be going a little bit funny with a particular study, these are systematically sampled papers um, that are then all pre-registered. So that's an open science practice where you write down the exact hypothesis, the exact analysis, the exact data collection methods that you're going to be using. You write down and register it beforehand so that you can then uh, clearly show um, that you're following your original plan. Um, they made all of their materials, all of the data when possible available. So these are very, these are attempting to be very high quality replications where someone else can hold you accountable to check to see if that replication did a good job. And what they're finding in these is only about a 40% success rate. So out of those 100 uh, studies, all of which are reporting a positive significant result, only about 40% are actually coming out uh, still significant. And the effect sizes in general uh, are becoming much smaller. So this is indicating that the results that we're seeing in the literature are inflated. All right, so at the Center for Open Science, we think the solutions, uh, that's great. Um, at the Center for Open Science, we believe that the solutions lie to this in lessons that we learned as children. So show your work and share. Um, we think that these are very basic lessons. And of course, sometimes it's the most basic things that they're hardest to figure out how to get right in practice. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so in order to do this, some of the things that the Center for Open Science rests on um, are some of the values and opportunities that we have in our scientific and research communities. So something that's really, really working in our favor is that, at least in theory, scholars really value transparency and sharing. When we publish our papers, we're doing so so that other scientists can read our work, see what we're doing, follow our logic. Um, sometimes we say that we, we, we are not about saying, trust me, we're about saying, show me. Um, we also see that uh, when it comes to increasing the amount of open sea or the uh, amount of transparency that we have in our work, um, there is lo a lot of idealism and especially among uh, early career researchers. We often see um, graduate students, uh, postdocs, early career professors who are really going out on a limb to say, I think that there's a better way that we can do this and just showing in their own work, even if they don't have access to, you know, big levers of institutional power to do what they can to do really strong science uh, to demonstrate how this transparency can be used. The other thing that's really nice about research communities is that we trust evidence. So if you can show evidence that changing a particular way of doing your work is effective, that it, it leads to an outcome that you like, um, we're fairly ready to say like, all right, I'm gonna listen to that evidence. I'm gonna change what I'm doing. Can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, when we think about the barriers or the things that uh, make it hard to take on uh, open science practices, um, this is something that I hope that SEI will be actively talking about because the barriers and the things that seem hard are going to be some of your most important teachers for figuring out how you can start to take on open practices and which of those are going to kind of have the most uh, bang for your buck um, or, you know, even be the kind of first places that you can start um, when you're looking at changing your practices. It's important to remember that these barriers can happen at every level. So they can happen at the level of your institution. It can happen at the level of the funders or the policies or the government decisions that, that impact those institutions. It can also be social. So if everybody around you um, is doing science in a particular way, you might be concerned about what other people are going to think of you. Like, will, you, will other scientists think that you're judging them if you start doing something? Um, and then of course, scientists are very busy. They're doing a lot of things already. And if they're being asked to take on, you know, yet another thing, um, it needs to be because there's gonna be a very clear benefit um, and that that's something that they can spend their time on. And then of course, there's the individual. Um, I sometimes wonder if this is why the Center for Open Science uh, kind of successfully came from social psychology, because uh, social psychologists are very, very ready to believe that our reasoning is not perfect. We're very ready to know that we can be subject to biases. We see what we want to see. We can be swayed by uh, 
uh, attachment to our own theories, our own career success, um, and all of those things are going to make it difficult for us to make good choices unless we create, um, you know, seatbelts, honestly, for ourselves. There we go. I found the connection. It's seatbelts again. Um, other challenges for science is that it's often very siloed. In a lot of cases, um, scientists may be working uh, in individual labs at universities. And even if there's a more collected institute, like wherever you are, whatever your structures are, it's always going to be harder to set things up across, um, uh, across groups or across divisions than it is within. Um, so you'll often have coordination problems. Um, and then specifically in academia, and I don't know whether this is something that you all face uh, as well, but there is often going to be a wariness for commercial solutions, a wariness of, um, especially in tech, uh, of things that might just be looking to profit off science without particularly improving it. So the Center for Science, Center for Open Science's earliest and largest uh, project and approach to improving open science is the Open Science Framework. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so osf.io is our uh, website here. So this is a free online platform for scientists. So it's essentially just a data repository. So the Center for Open Science is an open source, independent nonprofit. We're not affiliated with a university or a publisher or anything like that. Um, and what we provide is essentially a way to link together uh, all the different materials that you might be using in your research. So if you have cloud storage that you're already using either through an institution or through a service like Dropbox or Google Drive, you can link that up uh, to your OSF project to allow you to bring together all of the things that you might want to share um, and then let you make choices about which exactly of those materials you're going to keep private and which of those you're going to choose to share with the world. Um, something that we can talk about later is, is the fact that in many cases um, there are differential concerns, right? Uh, sharing is an all or none. It's often the case that some things are going to be easier to share than others. And so one thing that OSF is doing is trying to make it really easy and clear for you to make those choices. So uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Uh, so this is the basic OSF project. This is what you would see if you were uh, visiting a kind of a standard project. So what you see here is essentially uh, file storage on the right. So this is whatever files are involved in your research. Could be anything from scripts to text to uh, media files. And then just a simple wiki that lets you explain some context about what these materials are and how they maybe fit into a larger project. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Great. So then what OSF does is now that you've got that place to store your materials, um, we can now provide a number of different interfaces to those materials that support your work um, around the research lifecycle. So if we start on the right over there, um, the OSF data repositories give you a place to manage your data, uh, lets collaborators in multiple locations upload and work in a common place. If some of you are using GitHub and others of you are using Dropbox, you can link them to a common place so that everyone can see all of the materials. Um, but then if we go in a clockwise direction, um, when you're getting ready to report, um, you can then take those materials. Maybe you've been keeping some of those private up until now, but now you'd like to share them with the world. So it's possible to now go ahead and open up those repositories, make them available publicly. Um, we then also provide things like OSF meetings and OSF preprints. So this is storage that's particularly designed um, for people to upload uh, posters or uh, preprints of your work into a common location uh, so that it can be accessible and searchable by other scientists. Um, so, uh, OSF preprints is a platform that allows uh, scientific communities to run an archive like archive or bioarchive. Um, so when they're hosted on OSF, essentially what that means is that OSF is providing storage, common versions of metadata that then the community uh, can uh, make decisions about what types of preprints they're looking to be uploaded, what types of moderation, if any, um, happen in that preprint uploading process. So you'll see that differ across different OSF preprint servers. Um, and then when you're coming back around um, to the next project that you might be wanting to do on the basis of, you know, maybe some more free information that's now out in the open, um, OSF allows you to pre-register your research. So what pre-registration means, in case anyone's not familiar, um, is just that uh, when you're getting ready to run your experiment and you've got some 
confirmatory hypotheses for confirmatory uh, analytic tests that you're planning on doing, you can write them down beforehand. So, you know, you can imagine this is literally like writing it on a piece of paper, putting it on an envelope and, you know, signing it over the signing it over the top with a date on it. Uh, so what this lets you do is essentially say, like, I'm showing you the time stamped plan that I have for how I'm going to conduct this research, what methods I'm going to use, what tests I'm going to do so that later on when you're looking at your data, you're not as tempted to get swayed by something unexpected that you found. That's not to say that you shouldn't report those unexpected things. You absolutely should. Um, but this lets you clearly remember for yourself and for other people, what are the decisions that you're making prior to the data? And what are the things that are your decisions you're making based on the exploration of that data? All right, can I have the next slide, please? All right, so what do we do when we think about how an institution or a community or an organization is gonna change what they're doing? How do you change the culture? Um, we often think about this in terms of the cycle of how people adopt a new technology. So you've got your real early adopters who are really eager to try out anything new, um, kick the tires, you know, be your beta testers, you know, really work with something that's maybe not quite ready to go, but it's new and it's cool. They're ready to help you kind of figure it out. Um, then you've got people who are happy to try something, but they're looking for a little more support. And then maybe later on, you've got people who really would prefer to kind of stick with what they're doing unless there's a strong reason to change. So when we kind of think about this, we can think about this almost as like a pyramid of different types of interventions, different types of ways you can think about changing. So right up at the beginning, if you don't have a mechanism for how people can share something, you might need to start with that basic infrastructure. There just needs to be a way like physically or software wise for people to actually share this information. Once you've got that, if you do have something like that available, then you're just looking at these kind of additional types of cues, additional types of uh, pressures um, or support. They're going to help people decide whether or not they're going to make that decision. Um, so this is everything from like, look, it's just you, people are more likely to do things that are easy for them to do. So if you've got a choice between something easy and something hard, like people are going to go for the easy options. Um, so if you can make your option easier, it's going to get more attractive. Um, you can make it something that's rewarded um, just socially, like if it's an expectation that we all have for each other, we're holding each other accountable, that can be a really strong force for changing how we start to make those decisions. And then for an institution, this goes all the way up to, it can either be really formally rewarded uh, for taking on particular behaviors or even required if you're in a position where you can actually set a policy that people are going to be following. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Just, just to let you know, Melissa, there's a couple of minutes left. Yeah, great. Um, so in that case, what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit more about um, one of the larger interventions that COST is fo focusing a lot of our uh, attention on right now, which is registered reports. Um, could I have two slides forward, please? Um, oh, one back, sorry about that. Oh, I think I lost the slide. All right, so um, uh, registered reports, I've talked about pre-registration so far, which is just writing it down for your, for your own um, edification. Um, registered reports are about bringing that to the journal. Um, so rather than conducting peer review only after the results are all av available and the paper is all written, it's about taking that plan, that protocol, your specific hypotheses, and actually running your peer review at that point. One of the things that makes that really exciting is that you can get that really strong feedback about what experiment you should run, what data you should analyze, um, to kind of make that as best as it can possibly be. And then the thing that makes that more attractive for scientists who might take this on is that now you have a commitment from that journal that they're going to publish your study no matter how the results come out. Um, can I have a slide forward, please? Thanks so much. Um, so this is a really interesting example of an intervention because it brings in a lot of your stakeholders. Lots of people care about what happens in that peer review process for how a paper is published. Um, so what we can see, next slide. Thanks. Um, we can see that when journals start to provide registered reports as an option for people to publish, we see some of the types of changes that we're looking for in research culture. So compared to traditional articles, we see more null hypotheses getting published. Uh, null hypothesis results, excuse me. Um, that might seem a little strange, like, oh, like we failed more, like we're looking for that. And the answer is yes. This means that we are, we are, we are more quickly and more successfully finding out when our hypotheses are wrong so that we can focus on those that are correct. Um, and one more click. Great. 
And even though we're seeing more of these null, uh, null results, these things that are maybe a little harder to think about, maybe not as flashy, they're still being cited um, at similar or even higher levels as other uh, articles in the same journal. So scientists aren't losing this you know, really important marker that their, their work is being listened to. All right, so what does this mean for all of you all? Um, how can we kind of move this into a discussion about what steps SEI might wanna be taking? Um, the primary message that I wanna leave you with is that you've got a wide variety of types of change that you can consider, um, and then you can target those changes to your specific goals and contexts. So if you don't already have just sort of a basic uh, set, maybe you have a missing piece of infrastructure, maybe you're not currently pre-registering and you'd like to, maybe what you need to do is to identify a platform that you're gonna use for everybody to do it. Um, next slide. Um, you can also think about taking what you're doing and making it easier to do. Easier user experiences mean people are gonna enjoy what they're doing, they're gonna have an easier time. So if there's pre-registration, maybe you wanna make a template that's specific for your institution where you're pre-registering the specifics, the types of hypotheses, the particular important parts of protocols that are relevant for your types of science. Um, next one. Um, you can make it normative, right? So this is very, very much about just how you talk to each other, what kinds of things you focus on in your communities. You can highlight, um, so we use badges to say like, hey, look, I did share my data. You might be interested in knowing that. You can fold it into training courses. And it's also really, really important that this uh, that this type of debate uh, can also remain open. So this is just an example of two papers uh, arguing about whether or not pre-registration is valuable either at all or whether it's valuable only in certain contexts. And this kind of debate is really, really important because it's what's gonna sharpen in your focus and help you identify those changes that are actually going to work uh, in the right ways at the right times. Um, and then finally, from these informal norms, you can move on to the types of things that institutions can do. So either with your own funders or as you're making internal decisions, um, funders can ask you to take on open practices. You can have awards or uh, other types of recognition that specifically focus on rewarding those behaviors. Um, and if publishing is something that you focus on, then you can look for opportunities to publish things like registered reports that are gonna let you kind of show more fully this transparent process. Um, and then finally, one more level, um, something that we're only starting to uh, focus on just a little bit um, is the next slide, um, is actually making it required. So you can make the decision to actually make something sort of mandatory in a particular context. So here, one thing that COST does is provide basically example policies that a journal could adopt to say, this is what you would do if you wanted to make open data mandatory in certain aspects. Here's some language that you could use. Um, and then just last slide, next one. Um, I've talked a lot about pre-registration and registered reports, um, but just to remind you all when you're thinking about the types of things that you might wanna bring in or things that you're already doing that you wanna highlight and kind of pull forward, um, there's a lot of different behaviors um, and that's really how we think about it. You can think about what are the individual choices that you're making right now? How do you wanna shift those? Um, and what are gonna be the right tools to make those some successful shifts for you in your particular context? Um, so yeah, that's about all I have. Um, I've got a, the next slide just has some links. Um, I guess people can hang on to um, uh, as they're going. Um, I don't know if you can take a screenshot or the slides will be available after, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's all that I have. Um, thanks for thanks for keeping me roughly on track with the time here. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, what can I, how do we want to move on to discussion? Thank you so much, Melissa. That's a fascinating presentation. And uh, I think here on this slide, you should be able to click through. So take the opportunity okay. now uh, for people in the in the group here to click through to any of those links. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Melissa, again. Now, the next uh, part of our agenda is to hear from our Deputy Director and uh, Research Director, Orsa Pershan. Uh, who is uh, the respondent today. And that means uh, opportunity to uh, reflect on the keynote that we've had from Melissa and uh, and think about some ways to uh, frame this uh, in advance of the question and answer. Uh, and now keep uh, please to everyone who's in the in the group, please uh, type in any questions you have in the chat. And uh, Neil is there to uh, take note of those questions and can direct those to uh, Melissa or Orsa uh, and we get to the Q&A section next session. So now I'd like to ask Orsa to please take the floor. 
Thank you so much, Tim, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. That was really um, interesting, and I think we all uh, learned a lot. Uh, I also want to thank the whole team working with Tim to, to make this webinar happen and, and sort of bring this uh, project and discussion forward. So I don't want to take too much time and uh, because what we really wanted was this uh, webinar to kind of kick off a discussion, uh, activate you all as researchers in thinking about this. Um, but just to maybe I'll start with just reinforcing basically what, what Tim said also when introducing why we are doing this because SEI is not your, you know, we're not a big university, we don't have lots of labs, we're not doing that sort of type of science that's, you know, where you have a, a big a new breakthroughs or Nobel Prizes and so on, so you can feel a bit distant. So um, let me explain why we wanted to have this kind of learning project this year. Uh, first one is to really invest in our learning around the science uh, part. As you know, we're trying to bridge science and policy, and we have invested quite a lot recently at the CI in the kind of understanding better the policy end, the policy process that we want to influence and impact. Uh, we have a very nice uh, publication now and a policy assessment um, uh, prepared by Johan Schillenstjerna uh, with various tips on how to engage effectively with policymakers. Now, of course, we also have the strategic policy engagement streams where we are trying to work uh, more strategically and systematically with um, improving our uh, uh, potential to have impact. So now we just thought, let's let's invest a bit on the science side and try to keep uh, up to date what's going on in science. What are the big trends? And, and we chose this sort of framing of open science, but maybe there are also other big trends uh, we should consider. Um, and of course, the, the ultimate purpose is to understand also what do these science trends mean for sustainable development and also what do they mean in terms of uh, north-south relationships, etc. So that's the one, the first motivation. The second one, as Tim mentioned, also compliance with funder requirements. And uh, for example, we know that we need to um, be more um, uh, just well structured in how we, for example, explain uh, data management plans. And here, Melissa's uh, various tools come in very handy uh, on what kind of technical level, how to how to uh, make sure to share your data and make it available. But also, of course, here comes a question that Rasmus put in the chat. Also, you know, when is it not appropriate to share data, and when do you not want to have it open, etc. So that's a really important question for us. The third motivation, again mentioned by Tim, is that I think, uh, and this would be interesting to hear Melissa's reflections on, um, being a research institute where our mandate is not only to produce excellent science, but really to make it impactful and, and sort of make, make that bridge, how can we kind of position ourselves? Do we try to actually go beyond open science, not just make it available out there to stakeholders, but actually sort of actively make it accessible, make it relevant, uh, and sure there is uptake. So um, is, is there, you know, how can we can demonstrate leadership in how to do that? Um, so um, those were the motivations. And uh, I thought I would also say something. I thought this uh, next two final slide from Melissa was very useful, taking a step back, also looking at what are these sort of open um, science behaviors, I believe you, you call them, that, that we are really looking at when we talk about open science. And this was really the first step uh, that we started discussing, Tim and, and the team, uh, you know, what are the sort of key principles? Mm -hmm. And I'll just uh, read them out now, maybe as an input also to, to later group discussions. But our understanding, and again, we have experts with us, is that open science it uh, sort of involves maybe six or up to nine principles, um, some of which were mentioned in Melissa's uh, behaviors. But basically, it's open methodology, sharing how, uh, what methods you use and how you apply them uh, at an early stage. Uh, open source, uh, do we share our 
uh, codes uh, and how. And I know there's a discussion among our tool experts in SCI on, on when and how this is appropriate or, or not appropriate. Uh, open data, I think you covered this really well, Melissa. Uh, how do we um, prepare data management plans and store the data, etc. Uh, open access, I think uh, everyone are quite familiar with this. Um, how can we make our um, journal articles uh, openly accessible? Um, open peer review, uh, I think this is maybe more for journals, how they organize the peer review process. Open educational resources. So the idea that you know we are moving from away from the classroom towards uh, MOOCs, uh, virtual courses, and here SEI Asia has spearheaded some of that sort of online uh, training work. Uh, that was six principles, and <laughs> there are three more. Uh, open synthesis. I will actually leave this. This is something that Neil Hathaway is a, is a really uh, expert on, so he can explain it. Open interests, which I assume refer to being transparent with your uh, uh, who is funding your research, etc. And finally, open discovery. How do we actually discover research? How do we conduct literature reviews? Again, this is something where Neil Hathaway has a lot of expertise. So those are the things we're looking at and trying again, as Tim explained to assess mm -hmm. what is relevant to SAI and what is not, because Great. we are not so big so we can invest endless amount of resources into um, you know adopting all the, the kind of newest best um, procedures but we need to be a bit smart what what's what does really matter uh, for us to do uh, rigorous robust research but also have impact mm -hmm. so um, I think um, final well, two more comments from me. One was, I think it was interesting to hear your perspective, Melissa, also on, on the dysfunctional research culture, which I think many of us kind of uh, have seen, are aware of. Um, but I would also dare to say that this is, I mean, something we try to um, try to avoid, obviously, at SEI, but we try to balance our, you know, how we internally evaluate ourselves, uh, also not just individual level, but also as an institute. We are not only looking at the publication, citation metrics, but, but also um, our impact again. And that leads me on to my kind of final big open question, uh, maybe for Melissa to respond to or, or in the groups. I, Tim, you can um, uh, chair, let us sort of say what we have time for. But I'm curious, is there any relationship between the whole open science agenda and the sort of impact-led research agenda. We hear a lot now also about mission-oriented research and that science is supposed to be very active in solving society's problems. And in this vein, I think we, SCI has always sort of operated uh, in that mode, uh, very problem-led uh, research. But are these, are these just sort of parallel? Uh, trends in science or are they actually related? Is, will open science help us to have more impact ultimately uh, and vice versa? So that was my big discussion question to you all. But again, thank you very much, Melissa, for, for sharing your expertise. And um, we look forward to hearing from all SCI colleagues. Thanks. Thank you very much, Osa. And uh, I, yes, I think it would be great to, to hear from you, Melissa, on that uh, question that Oss has just posed. Uh, and right after that, uh, we can uh, go to Neil, who can uh, take us through a couple of questions that are emerging from the chat. So over to you, Melissa, first. Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you so much, Elsa. Um, it's great to great to hear a little bit more about what you all are focusing on right now. Um, and I think the question of what are you going to do <clears throat> kind of given like the size and the focus of your institute with these open behaviors is uh, is the exact question to be asking um, because you all are in contact closely it sounds like with scientific work you depend on that scientific work um, in some contexts it sounds like you're also doing your own analyses internally um, so something that i think that you can do that's very very valuable if you have those partnerships 
um, with scientists, especially if you use things that are open, if you notice that another scientist or a group is making things available and that you're then able to use them, you can highlight that whenever that's possible, right? So you can make it clear uh, both back to the scientists so that they know that these things that they are doing are actually having an impact on your lives. And then also when you're sharing things out, you can say, I'm able to do this because the science was made open and transparent. I'm able to make these policy recommendations because I can see clearly what things we're sure about and what things we're not sure about. Um, so this is a little bit related to the question about um, data confidentiality, which is very, very close to my heart. I'm a developmental psychologist. Most of my PhD I spent taking videos of other people's children. Um, so there are many contexts in which you can't share absolutely everything. It wouldn't be ethical to do so. Um, but what you can do is you can talk about why you're making the choices that you're making and you I can identify when you see something that's uh, ethically inappropriate to share or should be held back um, to really take a look at why it is that you're holding it back, both so that you can communicate what your values are. Say, like, I'm not sharing you with this because I don't have permission from this child. But th that also can help you identify the boundaries of what might really be OK to share. So I'm not going to share the videos, but maybe I can share for you um, the tabular data or say, okay, I can't show you the video of this child, but I can tell you these are the responses that they made on every on every line that's de-identified. I don't know what, who this child is. I can show you that data. Or maybe even that's too sensitive, but I can say, hey, I can't show you the values of this data, but here's my complete data dictionary with the definition and range of every variable in the data set, right? You can make those kinds of materials findable where then it might be appropriate to reach out to a researcher or to reach out to somebody to say, hey, I know this isn't totally, totally public, but can we come up with a way that we can share it in a more appropriate context? But like, you can't do that if you couldn't find at least a hint of what might be available. Um, so I really do think that both talking very openly about the choices that you make and then also about how you use other people's transparency can both be really powerful and effective. Um, the other thing that I, I just wanted to flag on this um, related to the question of impact or mission orientation, um, I don't know if this is as much a dynamic in the EU. In the US, there can sometimes be this funny tension that will develop where um, there, there's a mandate for, for some set of policies to be evidence-based, but there's no definition of what evidence-based means. And you can even sometimes get into a place where people may use that mandate for evidence-based to block change or to block an initiative, to say, we can't do anything. We don't have evidence for this. Um, like, I don't see a strong study saying that this is true. We, can, we, we shouldn't do anything right now. And so something that I think is really, really important for a policy or, uh, uh, facing organization to do is both to make a really strong case. If the evidence is there, make that case. Say, this is definitely evidence-based. These are the policies that you know that we can follow. And you become credible the more that you focus that on the things that you're very strong about and the things that you say, look, we only have initial evidence for this, but this could be exciting. Or, look, it's true. We have very little evidence on this, but we don't have time to wait. And although we don't have the evidence that this is the best program, we, can, we have strong reasons to believe maybe we have observational data, maybe we have data from a very, very different context, um, maybe we have imperfect data, but something where we can say like this action is better than no action or this action is better than status quo, I can tell you based on some limited initial data, but there's a mandate to act and so here's why you should act. Um, so I think that that like, I think that it can be very kind of nerve wracking. Like if you if you are trying to reach a goal like a that's values driven if you are kind of feeling like what if i'm in the position where i'm going to find out that you know something that i wanted to promote doesn't have a strong evidentiary base um that can be very scary but the thing that i hope that you that i think you have the opportunity to model is why why that's not something to shy away from but why it's something to move toward because it's what's going to let you get to those goals Right. Like if you're able to say, I very strongly feel this part is credible, this part is not so credible, then you become a trusted source. You become a trusted platform that you can make your strongest recommendations kind of in the most focused way. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe I'll stop there and uh, let, let us move on to some other questions. Yeah, thanks very much, Melissa. This is really um, fascinating talk. Really interesting to, to hear you talk about something that you're so passionate about. Um, We've got um, a couple of questions that are related. Taryn asks, how have the top tier and other journals responded to this philosophy and movement? Uh, because researchers aspire to publish in the top 
journals and their fields and their career advancements often depend on the mm -hmm. caliber of journals in which they work. Yes. Um, so what I'll say about that is it's certainly an evolving, it's an evolving field. Um, I won't speak to any particular journals just because I don't want to say anything wrong about a particular group um, or not kind of hit the ones that you are all are most relevant to. Um, but what I'll say about it is that we certainly catch their attention. Um, so for instance, some of the work that the Center for Open Science does is to study and to make public information about what journals are currently doing. Um, so for instance, with the top guidelines, um, what these are doing is essentially saying, our journal policies require you to either share your data or say what you can't. Our journal policies require you to upload your data either to a public repository or a protected uh, third party repository. Like, so there are these kind of different levels and then you can take a journal stated publisher, uh, publishing policies and say like, okay, which of these things are they currently asking for? Um, and some of the top journals are going to show fewer of these practices than some of the smaller kind of like front runner uh, kind of cutting edge journals that are trying out different models. Um, the other things that we see, so we see that uh, larger journals will notice if they're getting beaten on any metric uh, by a you know, so-called smaller, smaller journal. Um, and we also see that um, many of these larger publishing houses are also trying to, to promote their own open models. Right. So something that we see is that they understand that there's a pressure there. They understand that there's a desire for more open options. And so they are going to try to figure out how it fits within their business model and how they can, you know, kind of kind of uh, compete alongside rather than getting left behind if scientists are moving away from the older and more close models. Great. Thanks very much, Simon. My uh, notifications are popping over the uh, mute button. Um, thanks very much. We just had a, a quick question from David, which I'll go to because it, um, Innes's, I think, is uh, you've answered. Uh, to what degree can we pursue open science paradigms when many of our analytical tools are proprietary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we, we run into this as well. We um, work a lot with um, journal metadata, which we don't have permission to share, or journal full text articles, which we don't have permission to share. Um, and it's uh, a lot of open science is is going to return you to things that are very old and familiar, which is just good documentation. So if you're not able to publish the, you know, you can't publish the MATLAB code base or whatever it is, you're not, you're not able to just go around handing out free copies of MATLAB, but you can say, this is the version I use, these are the packages that I use, here's my analytic script that I can share with you. Um, the other thing that you may be, so that's one thing is to document as much as you can, share kind of everything around that proprietary part that you're not able to share, whether that's the code, the data. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is you can provide very clear instructions for how you would access that, right? So let's say it's a relatively unknown program that's, you know, only sold by one software company. You would say, I use this program, this version, you can access this program at this location, or you can access this data short source by applying to this organization. Um, so it's always going to be about limitations. There's almost no projects where absolutely everything can be made open. Um, something that I, I think can be really nice for just individual scientists, so you don't have to wait for a new mandate from your organization, you don't have to, or for um, not just scientists, I'm sorry, for, for people in general, something that you don't have to wait for is to do your work in a kind of sharing aware way. So even if right now you share nothing, you can work in a way where you can say like, well, what if, what if I was going to share everything? How would I do this if I was going to make this all uh, public or available for someone who doesn't already know about it? Um, and that includes both like making it just available and making it accessible, right? So how would I present this if I wanted it to be accessible to someone who's coming in for this the first time? Um, this has a big advantage for just you personally, very selfishly, which is that that person is you in six months, right? So you've gone away from your project, you've come back, you don't know what anything is. Um, that documentation is gonna help you as well. And then what that does is essentially, if you've, be, if you've been aware of the possibility of maybe sharing at some point in the future, when you find that right opportunity where you're gonna make something public that you weren't before, you're gonna be in a much just better state of preparedness to try to do that. That's great, thank you so much. I was gonna say, be kind to your future self is the best reason for me to be uh, Absolutely. selfishly be open. Um, 